Well, thank you, Claire, uh, and uh, thank you, Yvonne, for having me here this morning. And because Claire did um, such a marvellous job of acknowledging you all, I won't repeat it, except to say particularly to those who don't have to come to this place to work, thank you very much for coming along on what seems to me to be a freezing morning, but apparently it's going to be minus three tomorrow morning, and apparently it was minus six or minus seven a couple of weeks ago. So why people placed a national capital in this part of Australia is still utterly beyond me. Uh, but anyway, can I particularly acknowledge the MPs and the Senators here because it really reflects the bipartisan, or we should nowadays say non-partisan, nature of, of this area of public policy. I know Kevin Andrews is, has been at every palliative care function that I've been to. This is something that really does cross the aisles in both Houses of Parliament, and it's wonderful from time to time to be involved in a public policy discussion that brings us all together. The, the palliative care agenda, it seems to me, is essentially about dying with dignity, um, a whole range of levels of dignity, physical dignity, emotional dignity, uh, and in its broadest sense of the word, spiritual dignity. Um, older people to me uh, talk to me in my capacity as Minister for Ageing uh, time and time again about their unease uh, uh, around dying, and it's not about dying per se, it's their sense or their growing sense of unease that uh, their control over the manner in which they die, the location and the circumstances in which they die, they feel is becoming increasingly subordinated to our incredible technical prowess in keeping people alive, often in hospital, uh, usually in intensive care units. This is something that gets raised with me just almost every event I attend with older Australians. And can I um, just interpose by acknowledging my shadow Minister for Mental Health and Ageing, Connie Fear of Andy Wells. Thank you for coming, Connie. The best answer to that, that unease, although a range of different policies get raised, not least the euthanasia debate, but the best answer to that sense of unease and giving particularly older people a sense that, that, that they do have control over the manner in which they die is a strong system of palliative care buttressed by a solid system of advanced care planning or end of life planning. The statistics are well known in broad terms. Palliative Care Australia, although I don't think we measure this accurately as a government in, in precise terms, Palliative Care Australia tells, that, tells us that around 100 or 105,000 Australians die every year uh, of anticipated death. So not sudden death, but death that could well raise the need for palliative care, usually by terminal illness or just old age. Uh, there is a heavy reliance that we have, as most Western countries do, on the hospital system for those types of death, particularly, as I said, at the ICUs. But it is very clear that that reliance on the hospital system does not in any way align with general preference. Uh, I think the Victorian Government only in the last week or two released further material just to reaffirm that Australians generally want to die in place. They particularly want to die at home or in some cases in the aged care facilities where they've been living for some time, among their loved ones, uh, in familiar surroundings and not in a hospital, particularly in ICU, surrounded by machines that go bing. This is a, this is a bit of a no-brainer uh, for public policy, and it's nice to get no-brainers because usually they're a bit tougher than this. Uh, reducing pressure on the hospital system by allowing people to die in place at their home or in the aged care facilities they've been living in for some time uh, brings a whole range of different pressures together uh, and, uh, and clearly, very clearly aligns with what people want to do. Having said that, though, Australia does do very well comparatively in the area of palliative care. The Economist magazine last year uh, measured, I think, about 40 countries on what they called the quality of death, uh, and Australia ranked second very closely behind the UK, which people would know in this sector has done a hell of a lot of work over the last decade or so to improve their systems of palliative care. Uh, I think our, our high performance is a, a credit to the workforce in this area. This is incredibly tough work, as you know better than me. And we have an incredibly passionate and dedicated workforce who do this, whether it is in hospitals or in aged care facilities or visiting people's homes. And I want to pay credit to those people. But we do have more to do. And I think we have a couple of significant challenges, one of which is picked up in the theme of this, week's, uh, this year's Palliative Care Week. The first is to get better planning. Um, the Palliative Care Australia survey released this week it shows that fully two-thirds of Australians think that we don't talk enough about death. 
Uh, Australians are good at talking about a range of things, uh, including some self-evident propositions like, for example, why do we still play State of Origin when we have a national league, the AFL? Um, <laughs> people will talk about a self-evident proposition like that for weeks and weeks. Uh, but they're not very good at talking about death. They're not good at talking about death, particularly in advance of the death. This is something I came across when I had responsibility for the organ donation system. One of the very significant problems we had was that all, although about 90 per cent of Australians support the idea of organ donation, only about 50 or 55 per cent of Australians actually give consent to their loved one's organs being harvested because they haven't had the conversation. They don't know what the wishes of their loved ones were before death. This is a very similar theme in the area of palliative care. So the theme of this, uh, this year's week is timely. Uh, we should all be encouraging people to talk with their loved ones uh, about their wishes uh, in death, uh, to explore the options and to make some decisions and incorporate those decisions into an, an advanced care plan. The second challenge, though, is obviously uh, building capacity in the community. I mean, many people do go to hospitals to die because there is not enough capacity in the community, particularly not enough capacity uh, for people to die at home. And we have an ongoing challenge, I think, to build that capacity. Uh, PCA's work in this area is critical. They keep the pressure up on all governments, I think, to continue to build that capacity, and that is precisely what they should do. Uh, I'm pleased to announce today a couple of measures uh, from the government. The first is that uh, I'm uh, delighted to announce that the government will be providing uh, in very short term uh, $3 million in funding to Palliative Care Australia to operate a new equipment loan scheme uh, which will provide palliative care patients with access to specialised equipment when being cared for in a home setting. Uh, this will provide uh, PCA with funds, I guess, to purchase equipment that they see fit, but for example, it would provide uh, funding for an additional 200 electronic beds and pressure care mattresses, or 2,000 wheelchairs, or 300 hoists and slings, just to give you an example of the type of equipment that I know your state branches already uh, provide through their equipment loan schemes. I'm also pleased to announce the 2011 local grants, $5.6 million in new grants to, to improve palliative care support and services for patients, for their families and for carers. Uh, we know that there is a, an incredibly important role that community groups, health and aged care providers and charities play in providing the sort of palliative care supports that I've talked about in the community. Uh, and uh, over the next few days or couple of weeks, we'll be contacting 81 organisations who will receive grants of up to $150,000 to fit out their premises and to buy assistive equipment to provide that sort of palliative care support. So these are, these are by no means going to get us to the point where we need to be as a nation in terms of providing real choice to people uh, as they approach death, uh, in terms of the location in which and the circumstances in which they can receive palliative care. But I do hope that the measures I've announced today provide some assistance to the sector that works so hard uh, to support people at that very difficult time in their death. I want to pay tribute to PCA. I've uh, worked with them since I was appointed to this role and knew of them before I was appointed to this role. They do a wonderful job. Yvonne particularly does a wonderful job with her board, providing some level of national consistency over something that is still to a very significant degree run by states and territories. So congratulations on the work that you do. And I'm very pleased officially to launch Palliative Care Week uh, run by PCA. Thank you for coming this morning.